Welcome to NYCC as well. Today's keynote lecture is Joachim Frank. He is a professor of biochemistry and molecular biophysics and biological sciences at Columbia University. He is um, actually back in 1975, he was at Wadsworth and he did a lot of the seminal work in image processing. 2006, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. 2014, he received the Franklin Medal in Life Science. And of course, in 2017, uh, he not only received the Wadley Prize in Biomedical Sciences with Richard Henderson, uh, Barton Van Thiel, but also the Nobel Prize in Chemistry with Richard Henderson and Jacques Boucher. A lot of his seminal work has been done on image processing and single particle analysis, and quite fitting, he's leading off today for the single particle short course. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Uh, uh, wonderful to be here. Uh, if uh, if you see, if you see, whoop. Oh. Keep on talking, I'll adjust okay. this. Um, if I come down with a coughing fit, this is a common cold. <laughs> I've not been in China since November 5th. Okay. All right. um, so I just wanted to, um, essentially, uh, the way I, I understand the mission is, is to uh, give you uh, an introduction into basic concepts. Uh, that are all uh, underlying the um, uh, image processing and the, and the interpretation. So um, <coughs> we are using uh, the transmission electron microscope. Transmission means that, the, uh, that we take the uh, beam that goes through the specimen and uh, when we're not interested in anything that is reflected from the specimen. And as a, as a consequence, the uh <coughs> the uh, object has to be very, uh, very thin. And then we record uh, two-dimensional projections. These are, you can think, think of them as orthogonal projections, line integrals through the entire object. Um, so uh, the principle underlying all 3D reconstruction uh, from transmission EM uh, micrographs is the projection theorem. And uh, this here is, is just uh, sketched out. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, <coughs> you, uh, you take uh, projections in different directions. And a projection, according to the theorem, uh, is uh, um, represented by a two-dimensional uh, central section of, uh, of the Fourier, uh, of the three-dimensional Fourier transform. So uh, from that, you can already uh, Ghana, the, the recipe for <coughs> for the three year reconstruction, namely that you get as many projections as possible, and each of these projections then insert another central section here to the space, and then uh, through some kind of interpolation or mechanism, uh, you fill out the entire three D Fourier transform, and then you transform back. Okay, so that's sort of the concept underlying 3D reconstruction. Uh, so the first 3D reconstruction uh, from EM images was done uh, for uh, <coughs> a bacteria phage tail uh, using Fourier Bessel approach. And uh, so the heroes here are Aaron Klug and de Rossier, uh, his, his postdoc de Rossier, uh, at the MRC 1968. And uh, in the case of helical reconstruction, we don't actually have to uh, gather uh, uh, several projections because one, one single uh, projection already contains the information about the entire uh, view range uh, because of the uh, specific helical symmetry. <coughs> uh, now, how do we collect projections in, in the end? <coughs> so, so they are sort of two principal collection methods. Uh, and here, for reference, it's, it's a CAT scan method. Uh, if you have a, a patient, a stationary, you have an X-ray source, a detector, and they are, they are uh, turned around like this uh, in increments. And then you have an entire projection series, and then you go through the construction as I, uh, as I told you before. 
So, so this is completely equivalent to electron tomography, where the molecule is rotating, or can be any any resonance section or so, and the beam is stationary. Uh, so it's completely equivalent here. Single part of construction uh, for comparison is uh, <coughs> where the molecule uh, is in any uh, uh, orientation, uh, because we have thousands, we have millions of them, and they're all in, in all, all kinds of random orientations. And so we don't actually have to tilt. Uh, and we have, again, again parallel electron means that we have to collect and make sense of uh, what we wind up with. <coughs> So let's let's talk about the, elect the interaction of electrons with biological matter. Uh, this is sort of a regime between 100, 300 kV. Uh, so what you see is um, <coughs> you see a, a bunch of of trajectories here. They're not very easy to see, and, you know. Uh, but um, basically, you have different kinds of interactions. One interaction is the electron just sees the potential that it doesn't interact with the electrons. Okay? It just sees and it gets deflected in some way. Uh, and inelasticity means that the uh, primary electron hits uh, an electron and produces ionization, uh, displacement, and what have you. Uh, and in one case, no energy is, is exchanged. In the other case, uh, there's an energy loss associated with it. Now, the very big uh, uh, take-home lesson here is, is that uh, image information uh, essentially comes only from the elastically scattered electrons. Forget about the inelastic scattering. Uh, they, they produce some kind of a low resolution background, and they are essentially in the way. Uh, unfortunately, in this regime here, there are more inelastic scattering than elastic scattering. And so as a result, uh, once you, uh, uh, once you get, get, get to a certain thickness, uh, there's such an overwhelming amount of inelastic scattering that uh, you, don't, you don't get any signal anymore. Okay? So this, this is why uh, <coughs> the, the thickness is, is, uh, <coughs> um, is essentially the, the, the work of the thickness of biological material is only 0.25 micron, a quarter micron, okay? 2,500 uh, angstroms. So <coughs> radiation damage follows from the inelastic, uh, inelastic scattering. Uh, they're being destroyed as, as, we, uh, as they're exposed to the electron beam. Um, and, uh, and there are all kinds of processes like free radical, uh, free radicals, uh, which uh, which can uh, be further uh, cause further damage by by migrating around, uh, and and so uh, it's been discovered early on that by going down with the temperature very strongly go down in temperature we can uh, we can uh, prevent uh, the uh, the migration of free radicals, so we can uh, reduce. The, we, can, we don't reduce the radiation damage, but re we reduce the effects of radiation damage. Okay, <clears throat> and uh, then it, it's intuitive that radiation damage, uh, as you as you increase the dose, uh, radiation damage affects the high resolution features first, and then later on the lower resolution feature. So he has a Here's sort of an, a curve that shows the beam the sensitivity of the material. And you can look, use it as a lookup table. If you're interested in uh, four, four angstrom features, then you are at the spatial frequency of 0.25. And you can look up. Uh, you can only afford to use five electrons per angstrom sphere. Okay? Uh, so you, you can go. Uh, somewhere else, 10 angstroms, and you wind up with 15 or so. So, <clears throat> single particle approach to averaging a reconstruction. You know, single means unattached. It doesn't mean one only, okay? Uh, 
and, uh, <clears throat> and, and this whole uh, data collection method affects the methodology of specimen preparation, electron microscopy, image processing. So everything sort of comes in one package, uh, this entire methodology. Uh, <clears throat> so why single particles? Well, no crystals are needed. Uh, and we actually get the native conformation for, of molecules unaffected by crystal packing. <clears throat> and we get uh, potentially functionally meaningful states that can be visualized. And no part of the molecules needs to be chopped off for visualization, <coughs> as very often happens in extra crystallography. Multiple states can be visualized from the same sample. And it's ideal for looking at the dynamics of a molecular machine. Now, what I don't see, say here is, is uh, remember, uh, we talked about uh, Derisio and Kluge, uh, helical reconstruction. Well, they developed programs just to deal with helical, helically arranged molecules. They were useless for anything else, OK? So, so uh, there used to be programs that were tailored to the geometry and the, and the symmetry uh, of of the, the uh, of molecular arrangements, okay. So here, the single particle approach <laughs> means that we don't make any assumptions. Uh, we have a, uh, we have simply a reconstruction uh, scheme uh, that that fits all. Uh, the disadvantages up to 2000, uh, 2012 was that the uh, <coughs> There was a large computational effort, and uh, atomic resolution was difficult to achieve for particles lacking symmetries. Well, that's all wiped out. This, this entire problem was wiped out with the advent of the, uh, of the new camera, these fantastic cameras. Uh, they were, became commercially available in 2012, and they detect, they are able to detect single electrons have a superb signal to noise ratio, uh, very superior to film. <coughs> okay, so uh, to, to put it again in a nutshell, single particle reconstruction, the main initial assumption in signal processing are that all particles in the specimen have approximately identi identical structure, all are linked by 3D rigid body transformation, rotations, translations in 3D. And particle images are interpreted as a signal part, which is the projection of the common structure, plus noise. All right? So <coughs> how do we prepare, prepare a specimen? Well, this is the sort of the basic arrangement. Um, we have uh, uh, the M grid is held by the tweezers. Tweezers are held by a, by, by a rod, and <coughs> we now uh, put uh, a, a solution that contains the molecules onto the grid and plot the axis away. Plotting is important because remember, we, we want to keep the, the thickness uh, in, in the range uh, where electrons can, can penetrate. So uh, what we normally shoot for is something like a thousand angstroms. <coughs> and then uh, after that, the, the rod is released, the grid plunges into liquid ethane or ethane propane mixture, which is a liquid nitrogen temperature. Now, what, what is the meaning of this, this device here? Uh, well, it turns out that if we plunge directly into the liquid nitrogen, then air bubbles form at the interface between the, uh, the, the grid and the cryogen. And these air bubbles uh, don't conduct heat very well. And this delay in the heat transfer allows the ice to crystallize. So, uh, and that, that's undesirable because the, the water expands and uh, essentially crushes the molecule. So uh, it's the achievement of uh, Jacques de Gaucher that he came up with, with this uh, little vessel uh, filled with another cryogen, which prevents the, uh, the formation of the bubbles. 
And in a case like this, we get uh, almost instantaneous heat transfer. Uh, and under these conditions, uh, the water uh, it forms uh, so-called vitreous ice. It's glass-like. It doesn't, it doesn't crystallize. It is as if the water doesn't even notice that it's being cooled down. Okay? The structure uh, remains the same. And these are ideal conditions for preserving the, uh, the native state of the molecules. And <coughs> this is the scheme. There's a manual uh, device that you can put together for $200. And then the one next to it is something like $50,000. Uh, so the main difference is really that um, you want to, uh, once, once the grid uh, has been prepared uh, with a packing and plotting, you want to instantaneously uh, get this in here and uh, prevent, uh, prevent any uh, evaporation at that stage. So if you want to really keep exactly the thickness that you have achieved at this stage. So that is done by the, uh, <coughs> uh, by the surrounding of uh, environmental chamber. The environmental chamber can be controlled in temperature and, uh, and humidity. OK. So uh, specimen preparation. I just want to go through this here in steps. Uh, now, uh, it used to be that we try to get as pure if, uh, as pure as possible with the sample, but then uh, with the advent of very powerful software systems, uh, software programs, uh, it, it is no longer so stringent uh, because we have classification uh, methods. You can call them computational purification. Uh, so. In many experiments, it's even desirable to admit molecules in different conformation and compositional states because that, that will tell you some kind of a story. Okay. <coughs> so then we apply a sample to the EM grid, as I, as I uh, showed you before. And then we have the carefully controlled plotting. Um, and the coverage with molecules is determined by a lot of factors, actually. A sample concentration uh, and the geometry and makeup of the metal grid, uh, the geom geometry of the overlaid carbon grid, uh, and optionally overlaid thin carbon film. So there are all kinds of tricks now that are applied. Uh, here is a three millimeter grid, uh, and uh, then uh, this is all covered with a uh, with a carbon film. The carbon film is perforated uh, in a regular way. This is so-called quantic form, uh, which can be ordered uh, in different varieties. And then uh, the specimen is then actually uh, on a, in a hole uh, covering the, the carbon film. And uh, <coughs> so if we look in the cross section, we have a, a, the ice spanning the hole, and here are the molecules. And uh, there's obviously an influence uh, on this geometry by, uh, the, by, the, by the edges uh, because they, they, uh, have an, uh, they are a factor in, uh, in shaping the meniscus. And I have another picture here uh, that, that shows you all the different things, uh, copper grid, the quantifold, uh, that is overlaid over the uh, over the grid, and then you have an optional thin carbon film, uh, which is uh, in, a, in a range of 100 angstroms, and it produced by evaporation of mica and floated onto the quantified coated grid. And <coughs> this this particular this this additional uh, film. Uh, and some people do, some people don't, uh, enhance the signal of the power spectrum. Uh, that's important for the determination of the contrastructure function. Uh, and uh, in some, for some uh, molecules, uh, it uses more even coverage 
of orientation. So for ribosomes, uh, it makes a lot of difference if you have this thin carbon and you have much more uh, even uh, orientational spectrum, which somehow sounds counterintuitive, but uh, that's, that's how ribosomes behave. <coughs> So you can you can have these kinds of effects uh, <coughs> since you have or you have this sort of meniscus there in the hole. So in the middle of the hole you have thin ice toward the edge, you have thick ice, and then molecules might might tend to aggregate uh, in, the, in the edges. It's one of the many uh, effects that you have to look out for. And then, you know, there was always this, this naive common assumption that the molecules are sitting somewhere any, at random somewhere inside of the ice. But, uh, but that notion has been really dispelled by very careful studies here uh, at, this, at this place uh, by uh, uh, Alex Noble, uh, and he did a tomographic reconstruction of the uh, of the grid itself, and in it, it order to look where exactly molecules are, are situated, and he found that in most cases they're simply sitting uh, at the top or at the bottom, so they, they like to sit at the uh, air water interface, and that brings up questions about uh, can we can we trust the structure that we get, that we get out? How many molecules? Are actually uh, still in the original uh, in the original state. <coughs> uh, gold grids. Uh, uh, this was an. Uh, it was something that uh, was discovered at the MRC in 2014. Uh, they discovered that uh, the normal uh, uh, the normal grids uh, will. Uh, yeah, under under electron beam will act like a drum. Uh, somehow, because of the charging effects, uh, it sort of goes up and down, and it has a side um, a side components uh, which all interfere with the resolution. And uh, they discovered that uh, by using gold grids, you can reduce the effect by 50 fold. And you can see this here. This this uh, this line here is for carbon, and down there it is almost uh, <coughs> almost coinciding with the x-axis is the result for, for gold. So many people now use either gold grids or uh, gold-coated grids uh, in order to uh, <coughs> eliminate this problem. So. Uh, Let's look at an EM grid at different stages of magnification. Uh, so in the next set of slides, I have the illustration of the sample on the grid. After blotting, the grid is covered with a thin layer of liquid uh, containing, mo uh, liquid con containing molecules. And this, these are uh, GIFs that were created by one of my graduate students. So it's a simulation of what you actually see and gives you an idea of the vast amount of real estate that you have in your in your grid. Okay. Okay. So now we are at the stage of the actual uh, <coughs> it's the image frame, and so you imagine that the <coughs> that the molecules are just bouncing around there do their uh, conformation and motion uh, in, in the thermal environment. And then uh, uh, we, put it, we put it in ice. Uh, I, I mean, we, we plunge the specimen into uh, the cryogen and then look at it in the electron microscope. So you have essentially uh, everything is frozen in terms of its conformation, but it's also actually frozen or in, in terms of temperature. And uh, what you see is sort of a salt and pepper uh, rendering of the molecules because uh, we need to keep the 
radiation, uh, radiation damage low, which means that we have to keep the electron dose very low. The electron dose has to be kept so low that the image is not recognizable anymore. Which really means that um, in order to uh, in order to use single particle data, we implicitly have to use averaging. We have to always uh, uh, use many more molecules than uh, than we would need from uh, from uh, from the point of view of geometri geometry. <coughs> so the next stage would be that the computer locates these particles and then puts them in a gallery. Okay. So, <coughs> so to eliminate noise, we need to average images containing the same signal, the molecule projection, but to do that we must align them first and we must sort them into homogeneous classes of same images. In the example that I just showed you, there are at least two different conformations. So it doesn't make sense that lump all the data into one uh, into one bin and uh, an average over uh, overall, uh, because then we get uh, blurring, blurring of uh, very important features. <coughs> okay, so so with this, I just want to want to signal that um, we need to have some way of classifying and sorting images. And I'll, I'll come back to this later. Now, I just wanted to uh, introduce something important, which is the signal and noise, the definition of uh, the, <coughs> and the definition of the signal to noise ratio. Now, the signal is, uh, is the predictable deterministic uh, part uh, of the image and originates from the object. And the noise is uh, stochastic, unrelated to the signal, it's aperiodic, no two realizations are the same. So if we take two images of the same object, or they're not alike, they're only alike in the common signal content, but they're completely different in the noise content. Now the signal to noise, the, uh, the noise part in electron micrographs is very, very large. It's 10 times as large as the signal part. And uh, we have the definition of the signal to noise ratio this is, is <coughs> defined, or at least we use it, this definition in electron microscopy, is the signal variance divided by the noise variance. <coughs> So now, averaging over n noisy realizations of a signal increases the signal to noise ratio by a factor of n. Okay. <coughs> now, uh, I, I want to note that what is signal and what is noise in a given experiment depends on the way the experiment is designed. It de depends on your point of view. Okay, I'm going to show you an example of this. So. <coughs> <coughs> One of the most important uh, um, parts of the noise is the shot noise. Uh, I already showed you the, before the salt and pepper effect uh, in, uh, <coughs> with the low exposure settings that we need. Um, we get uh, a lot of fluctuations uh, in the impact of electrons and that's uh, what produces this kind of shot effect. <coughs> And here is a simulated images of ribosome at uh, a signal to noise ratio of 0.1. Now 0.1 is uh, the typical signal to noise ratio of, uh, of electron micrographs. Now structural noise, uh, this is exactly the concept uh, that what is signal and what is noise depends on your point of view. Here we have uh, a molecule that we want to study and it is on some kind of a background. Now the background from the point of the, the, the imaging is, is actually part of the signal, okay? But from the point of view of, of finding the structure of the, uh, of the molecule, uh, it is really noise, okay? We have to regard it as noise because this is the, the, the part that we want to average over. <coughs> so, 
Uh, and then to introduce the next concepts, including imaging, uh, contrast transfer function, image alignment, we need the definitions of Fourier transform, convolution, point spread function, cross correlation function. I have to really sort of brush over all these different things, and I hope that you are able to go and find uh, all these things in textbooks. Right now, this is just for connecting all these different concepts. <coughs> Here's a 2D Fourier transform, and, <coughs> and it is a <coughs> is an uh, <coughs> uh, we are. Uh, <coughs> Decomposing. We are decomposing the image into elementary images. And these elementary images, you can think of sine waves. Uh, and they are actually uh, mathematically represented by exponentials. But also conceptually, you can think of them as sine waves. Um, and the sine waves are uh, <coughs> have different um, wavelengths, and they have different amplitudes, they have different phases, uh, namely how, where, where this whole package sits in the image frame. And <coughs> they are the, the, wave <coughs> the wavelengths uh, are, are designated as uh, spatial frequencies. <coughs> so <coughs> in order to um, uh, represent an image, uh, we see uh, we need to have a, a, a very large series of of these elementary components, where each of them have the, has a has a, a different uh, amplitude and phase. Okay, so we can think of these uh, as ordered in a in a scheme in a two-dimensional scheme, and uh, and these are in this scheme every point has a has a, a different um, different spatial frequency components, and uh, and each has a face and an amplitude. So we can really characterize the image as an as a series uh, of these elementary signals. And here here is the uh, such a representation for a discrete Fourier transform because we. Uh, we only de uh, deal with discrete representation of images, so we, we don't deal with integrals. We deal with the uh, with a discrete series, and a discrete Fourier representation implies the repetition of the image uh, on an infinite lattice. So here, uh, if we I'm gonna represent this here as a as a series. Uh, as a discrete series, then it implies that actually I represent these images going on in uh, infinity. Right I'm going to uh, use uh, a, a very simple notation, uh, a, a use a Fourier operator. Uh, so a Fourier transform, yes, thank you. <coughs> Fourier transform uh, is a function of spatial frequencies, and that you can think of as being generated by all <coughs> the operation of a Fourier operator on the function f of r. An inverse Fourier transform just goes goes backwards. <coughs> okay, so there is an important theorem, uh, which is called the possible theorem. It's conservation of power or conservation of information contents. <coughs> so uh, if f of k is the Fourier transform of an image i of r, okay, then uh, we uh, can define uh, a power spectrum uh, is, the, is the absolute square uh, of the Fourier transform. So it's called the power spectrum. And the total power is the same in real and Fourier space. So we ca I can, <coughs> I can uh, either average, uh, no, I can integrate over the Fourier transform uh, and just leave out the, the zero term 
And I get the same by uh, <coughs> taking uh, the actual definition of the uh, <coughs> uh, definition of the uh, <coughs> of the variance. Okay, so uh, the Fourier transform conserves the power, uh <coughs> and it's a it's a loss-free uh, operation. Now the relationship between point spread function and uh, contrast transfer function. So in an optical system, the aperture limit, <coughs> the aberration of the lens, and other imperfection have the effect that a single point in the object is imaged as an extended two-dimensional function, the so-called point spread function. So in, uh, in an ideal system, a point would be re represented by a point. Okay? But because of the imperfection of the, of the instrument, it is actually imaged as a little extended disk. Okay? And that disk is called point spread function. <coughs> and the, point spread, uh, the Fourier transform of the point spread function is the contrast transfer function. Okay? So <coughs> an image, an, the, uh, uh, the image formation can be characterized in, in one of two ways either in real space by saying what the instrument is doing to a single point, namely it produces a point spread function. Or it can be characterized in Fourier space uh, <coughs> by saying uh, what, <coughs> how, how does the instrument influence the Fourier transform? Well, the, uh, the answer is it multiplies the Fourier transform by the contrast transfer function. Okay, <coughs> and the <coughs> in the transmission electron microscope under bright field condition, the uh, CTF is given by an analytical impression uh, expression. The CTF is sinus of gamma of k, and the gamma of k is now a complicated function. And this is the this function is the wave aberration. Here we have the different terms. Now, just to explain the spherical, spherical operation. So, the, the lens, the electron microscopy, is very peculiar in that uh, the, focal, the, the focal, focal length depends on where exactly the beam intersects in the lens. If it inter intersects very close to the uh, to the optical axis, then uh, the, uh, the focus is far away from the lens. If uh, if we take a beam uh, that is that is far away from the optical axis, then the focal length uh, becomes shorter, so which means that in the spherical aberration. Uh, constant is negative. Okay, it simply means that that uh, 
the curvature uh, of the lens is such that uh, the focal length uh, becomes shorter uh, as we move out uh, with, the, with the beams. <coughs> so here I, I'm showing you an example for a point spread function. Uh, so it's a two-dimensional function, and this is just a three-dimensional display to show you how, how far, how, how large it is. Uh, so it is, you know, in, <coughs> in the ideal instrument, you would just see one single peak going up, and instead we have an expanded function. And it's not just sort of a Gaussian, but rather it has ripples, it has side ripples. Uh, these side ripples can be can extend uh, to a very large distance, uh, which means that the image actually <coughs> has contents uh, that are outside of the of the molecules of the image. Okay, so you cannot simply uh, say, okay, I have an image of a molecule, and you just form a mask around it and take this and then process it. You cannot do that because there's outside of the image there are these ripples on the point spread function that have to be taken into account in the processing. So, uh, <coughs> and the larger the, the focus is, the larger this window is that you have to keep around the, the object. So convolution theory. Uh, we have an object here, and it's indicated by, uh, by points and uh, to have a point spread function, uh, point spread function, what it simply means is that, that uh, we place this point spread function at every place where we find uh, our, our object, okay? Uh, so, uh, <coughs> Instead of the, uh, let's say, a delta function here, we now have, uh, we have placed the point spread function. So this, this, looks, this looks very trivial, okay? Uh, but it's only trivial because this is a discrete case where they are separate from each other. But, but what, what if they are, if we now have an, a reading for every single point here? Uh, so we have an intensity in the image for every single point. We have to replace every single point and weight it or and replace it with a constant function here, with a weighted constant function. And then have to integrate it, uh, integrate for all the different contributions. So this is the this is the convolution <coughs> function. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> so the convolution theorem, I actually didn't, didn't put this down here. Convolution theorem is saying that um, instead of this very complicated superposition integral that we have to form for a continuous uh, function, um, we can go into Fourier space and then uh, use the Fourier transform of the, of the object in the Fourier transform of the point spread function, which is the CDF, which is the contrast transfer function, we simply multiply them. And then we get the uh, <coughs> convolution product in Fourier space. For some reason, an, an, a slide here sort of slipped. <coughs> contrast transfer function. So here is a, uh, here's an example of contrast transfer function uh, for a particular defocus setting. Remember, the, with a defocus, you, you control the, the actual shape of the function. <coughs> so this one here <coughs> goes down. Uh, so it will use negative contrast. The uh, Fourier coefficient is, is, is rendered uh, negative with negative sign. <coughs> Interesting feature here is that it starts with zero at zero, so we have very small 
contrast uh, for very large features, which simply means for single particles, uh, single particles don't stand out very well uh, from the background. Um, so then it reaches the maximum and it's doing some wiggles here. Then it goes, it goes and <coughs> oscillates back and forth. Uh, so essentially, we have one portion here, which is um, essentially um, a sort of a band of, of uh, contrast uh, with essentially the same the same weight, uh, but then it's followed by a rapidly oscillating curve, which means that here <coughs> we have uh, <coughs> we have no information at whatsoever uh, at those zero crossings. Then we have in between a, a positive contrast, negative contrast, and so forth. <coughs> Now, if you don't do anything with the image and just leave it as it is and uh, take it take it as a given, then we can say that the, the resolution of the, of the image, the, the signal that we actually becomes productive, goes, goes up to here. All this here so levels, of, uh, levels out because of the rapidly oscillating contributions. So in order to make sense of the image, or in general, in Cryo-EM, uh, in uh, we need to uh, apply contrast transfer function correction. Of course, in order to do that, we need to know the contrast transfer function. So there's another step in between, which means that we need to find it out directly from our data. You might say, uh, well, we know the defocus setting of the instrument. Well, these are nominal settings. You cannot trust them. If you, uh, if you put the uh, <coughs> instrument at a particular defocus, uh, that's not necessarily the defocus that uh, the, the specimen sees. Okay? So the defocus, or it's a CDF, really needs to be determined from the data Net from, not from the instrument. And uh, then I should point out the envelope function. <coughs> so if we had an, if we have an, a, an instrument uh, which had no coherence problems, then it would simply go on. This kind of uh, <coughs> oscillation would go on up to this. Uh, level, but uh, in the in the actual uh, experimental case, we have the presence of energy spread and defocus spread and angular spread, uh, and, and, and all these terms are uh, summed up under the, uh, <coughs> the under the term of partial coherence, uh, and the partial coherence can be represented by the action of an envelope function. So uh, if you have a uh, <coughs> contrast transfer function as determined by the formula that I gave you before, the analytical formula, you then have to go and, and multiply it with the envelope function in order to get the actual uh, function. Uh, so energy spread uh, <coughs> means that if, if you have voltage changes, you have wavelength changes. Defocus spread, the defocus changes have approximately the same effect as voltage changes. Okay. Um, 
and the envelope function due to energy spread and defocus spread is independent of the defocus. In the angular spread, uh, <coughs> the point source is replaced by an extended source, and um, uh, if we have convergent or non-parallel illumination. And the envelope function due to angular spread is defo defo defocus dependent. So we have two kinds of envelope functions. One is uh, independent of the focus, the other one is dependent. <coughs> okay, so, um, <coughs> uh, so here is simply the formula. The uh, CDF that you actually see is the idea of CDF times the envelope to the energy spread times the envelope to uh, the angular spread. So what, what could give rise to uh, changes in defocus? Well, there's a very simple effect, which is that the, uh, that the position of the specimen inside uh, of the ice layer uh, could be different. You know, for instance, if you have uh, half of the molecules on one side and half of the molecules on the other side, then you have a defocus spread, okay? Uh, so they not, cannot be characterized by the same defocus. So if you <coughs> if you make use of the of the molecules without without taking care of them individually, then uh, <coughs> uh, then uh, and, and, and you, you simply apply one single defocus, then you make an make an error, which is at least half of the uh, <coughs> half of the depth uh, of the of the ice layer. Here are an, a number of uh, examples for contrast transfer functions uh, for different focus settings. Now, how do we find out contrast transfer function? We find it out from the tone rings. And the tone rings are, are named after Fritz Tone, who was a pioneer in uh, optical diffraction analysis. So he was the first to put micrographs into an optical diffractometer, and we saw these rings here. The rings could be interpreted in terms of the analytical uh, <coughs> functions that I, that I told you about. Okay. Uh, so, <coughs> so why do we see the rings at all? Well, we see the rings because uh, we have uh, used carbon form, and carbon has a Fourier spectrum that extends everywhere. Okay? It's like an, a white spectrum. And you can think of the CDF as a, as a filter. It's, you can now see, see what it's doing to a white Fourier spectrum. You can see that it, that it suppresses uh, certain spatial frequencies, namely exactly at the zero transition. You know you can count. This is going to be this part is negative, uh, negative contrast, zero transition, positive contrast, zero transition, negative contrast, and so forth. You don't see the difference contrast because we're looking at the square. So this is now an ideal way of, of getting information about the contrast transfer function because you can collect it from the data itself. So that's we we have the CTF find programs, which make it possible to uh, to look look at these here and compare them with the uh, <coughs> with the analytically predicted ones, and then you, you, you try to do a match, or the computer is trying to do a match, and then it finds out uh, the computer finds out the, the precise settings <coughs> that you, you can then use for subsequent uh, <coughs> uh, contrast transfer function correction. I'll yeah, just show you uh, some, uh, uh, some things that the tonerings show. Uh, one important thing is how far the information transmitted ranges in Fourier space. You can see how far the ripples go uh, as opposed to the noises. 
Okay. And then you can also see whether the lens is astigmatic, astigmatic, or then you get this kind of elliptical range. And just don't 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 even consider them. Stay away from that. Uh, just spend some more time on the on the microscope. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, so I'm going to go into alignment and averaging uh, in two dimensions. Uh, here is an, it's one of the early applications of these ideas. Uh, so we have now a, uh, a series of, of molecules, and they're all in the same place in the image field. Uh, so uh, in order to put them there, we need what is called alignment. Okay? So without alignment, uh, you essentially your average apples and oranges. Okay? You have to put them in to the same, exactly the same place. Then you get an average, you get a variance map. Var variance map you get when you go to the column of uh, <coughs> uh, of, uh, uh, of the pixels. Uh, as you as you average, and then uh, and, and compute the variance. So in each point, we have the variance of the column of of, uh, of pixels, and you see they tell you something. In this case, and we had uh, used negative negative staining. Now negative staining produces a meniscus uh, around the molecule, and this meniscus is at different heights. Uh, which means that it's a very large component of variation right at the edges of the molecule. The variance map reflects this. Okay? So here is where we see very strong uh, variability. And but the molecule itself, we have no variability. So for alignment, we use uh, the translation cross-correlation function. Uh, so it's, an, it's a function that is defined in this way. We essentially have an, have an image, and then uh, we have the two images. We put them on top of each other with, with variable shift vectors. And for each shift, each shift vector, uh, we perform a, a computation of the of the of the, uh, <coughs> of the sum uh, over all product terms. Okay? So we have now uh, for each of these shifts, we get one value the cross correlation, uh, and we change that shift, we get another value. So we populate the entire array, and this array is then called uh, <coughs> uh, cross correlation function. This cross correlation function <coughs> is going to have a peak uh, at the place where you have uh, the, the maximum similarity between the images. Uh, so this the translational uh, cross correlation assumes that the images are in, in the same rotational alignment, uh, but they're not. So we need to have uh, an equivalent operation for the rotational alignment. And in fact, we can combine the two together, if I, uh, I'm going to show you in a moment. But, um, but before I, I, I say this, I want to point out, uh, here's the formula that I was going to show you before. Uh, convolution product uh, is, uh, <coughs> here's the object times constant function uh, the object convoluted to a constant function. In Fourier space, it is uh, the, <coughs> uh, <coughs> the transform, the Fourier transform of the image is equal to the Fourier transform of the object times, simply scale a lot of different times, the contrast transform function. So <coughs> this is the convolution. Cross correlation has a very similar. Uh, <coughs> uh, simplification in Fourier space. Uh, so I'm just 
supervise cross correlation in this way. There's a very complicated expression here <coughs> in the real space. And the Fourier space it collapses into something very simple. Or uh, it's again a, a product, but it's a conjugate product. Okay? So in order to do a to uh, <coughs> compute a cross correlation function, all we have to do is Fourier transform both functions that we are uh, uh, <coughs> both both images, and then uh, we take Fourier transform of one image and the conjugate Fourier transform of the other uh, form the product and then go back into Fourier space and into real space. Okay. So this is, um, that sounds very complicated, but it actually it is much, much faster than going through the real space calculation. <coughs> So, so this is just uh, in the case of, of the identical images, then you get a, a very a, a very uh, defined uh, peak. It's a delta-like peak of the cross correlation. Uh, <coughs> this is the absence of noise, <coughs> and so you get such a such a defined peak because these are identical uh, images. Now we take another case, okay? So uh, here, there's something constant uh, because the position of the face is constant. The rough shape of the face is constant, okay? So we do get, again, a cross correlation peak that indicates how, how much the images are shifted with, with, with respect to one another. But the, but the peak is very blurred. And then it's blurred because these images are uh, very dissimilar. Which is as similar as I could find on the internet. <coughs> um, OK, so I'm, I'm going to show you a, a very simple application of the theorems that I just told you about. I mean, this is sort of a very simple algebra uh, that you can apply in your head when you have any kind of uh, problems. <coughs> um, the, uh, well, I didn't introduce autocorrelation functions. It's the function uh, that you get when you cross-correlate cross an image with itself. Okay? Um, <coughs> and uh, let's just uh, directly switch over to, to this here. The Fourier transform was a cross correlation of two images of the same object with different cross correlation, uh, with different contrast transfer function. That happens very often. You do it all the time. You know, if you get into this business. <coughs> and <coughs> <coughs> now we apply uh, the uh, the various theorems. Uh, we apply the convolution theorem in order to say that uh, it's, it's a, an, an image, uh, an, an object uh, times uh, CGF. Uh, and sorry, what did I do here? I think, all uh, oh, right, right, OK. Uh, so it's an, it, it, it's an, it's one. Uh, object and one CDF, and now we have the same object but another CDF, H2. Okay, uh, so this this term here comes from the convolution uh, application of the convolution theorem. This here comes from the application of the cross correlation theorem, uh, and then you can simply. Uh, since, since this is a simple uh, product, uh, we can reorder the terms and wind up with S1, S1 conjugate uh, times H1, H2 conjugate. Conjugate here you can forget because uh, because uh, this is a real space function. I, I, I mean, it's a real, a real definite function. 
Um, and uh, so this here is recognizable as the autocorrelation function, the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function uh, of the object. And this here is the cross-correlation function uh, of the part spec function in the real space. So the result is it's the autocorrelation function of the object convoluted with the cross-correlation function of the one spread functions. Now, uh, I just want to tell you the importance of padding. What is padding? Padding means that you you put you put an image into a larger frame and put the average outside. What is this used for? Well, remember when I when I told you before that the uh, <coughs> that the discrete representation discrete Fourier representation of an image implies that the image is extended infinite in, in, in infinite ways. So if you if you think of the of what what happens when you when you do a shift, then you essentially you shift the neighbor onto 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 uh, the you, you shift one neighbor onto another one. So you sort of overlap. <coughs> uh, so the need for padding follows from the discrete Fourier representation. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, that's the usual situation where yeah. I have lots, Not lots of lots. Yeah, okay, but, but at least at least this this I I, I got across I think. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so uh, translation alignment using cross correlation function. Uh, this <coughs> this here is one of the images. Let me show the other one. But uh, this is this is what it looks like in 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 the real case. Uh, and <coughs> so uh, the <coughs> we see a peak in the cross correlation function if we just look in it in the in the coordinate system uh, and draw the axis we see that the uh, <coughs> that the image is shifted by a particular vector. So what <coughs> what we do computationally is is uh, we're doing uh, cross correlation of images, and then we do a search by the computer, uh, search searching for the, for the highest peak. And then we get the position of the highest peak. And <coughs> uh, now it's it's obvious from what I told you about the contrast transfer functions, uh, and the it's implicit in the. A correlation theory that um, if, if you have <coughs> if you have a lot of large difference in p-focus, then what can happen is that in one case the uh, contrast transfer function you know goes uh, uh, is is um, you know on the average negative, and in the other case it's on the average positive, which could could mean that the correlation peak could be very close to zero or it could even be negative. Okay? So here is an uh, example of, of uh, <coughs> uh, the, the kinds of cross-correlation uh, peaks that you can have. Uh, here is an, uh, you, you can see that there are inversions of contrast in a positive, negative, positive, negative. And uh, <coughs> this is an, sort of an old formula that arrived a long time ago together with Owen Sexton, uh, which convinced us at the time that single particle, uh, single particle methods are going to be feasible. And, uh, and it, it's, a, it's a simple question. Uh, what happens if, if I <coughs> have, a, 
have a property office that I haven't done, and uh, <coughs> and we have a certain contrast, uh, and we assume the contrast in, in ice. <coughs> <coughs> And we have a certain practical exposure beyond which the molecule gets destroyed. So we, we just uh, put, put the critical exposure here. Uh, we insert values for contrast uh, and uh, the resolution that we are looking for. So we used co uh, contrast in eyes. The resolution was three abstrams and found out that uh, the whole method is going to work if the diameter of the molecule satisfies this criteria. And if we insert uh, the diameter of the ribosome, uh, we found out that it's definitely going to work. Okay? So this was sort of a milestone here in thinking of uh, 1977 that convinced me that uh, indeed the entire methodology would make sense. Okay, so maybe I'll just finish with this with this one, uh, how to combine translational or rotational alignment uh, that can be used by it can be done by using invariants such as the autocorrelation function. Okay, so this is uh, <coughs> Let's say this is an object, uh, and the, the image consists of these three dots. And the only correlation function uh, that you create by cross correlating this with itself, or it's, it's this kind of symmetric, symmetric function. Okay? It's this vector reflected here, uh, <coughs> and this vector is, is reflected right here, and so forth. <clears throat> okay, and it's centrosymmetric. <clears throat> okay, now <clears throat> simply the idea is we get the other correlation uh, of the of the molecule. <clears throat> And uh, the other correlation function is always centrosymmetric, always centered on the origin, no matter how, we, how much we shift from the molecules. <coughs> so it means that if molecules are in different uh, shift positions, the other correlation function is, is always in the center. So we can then uh, first compute the other correlation of the images and then uh, rotate the other correlations against each other and find the position of best overlap. Okay? So that's how we can completely decouple the search for uh, translation and rotation. All right. So, um, so this is um, uh, then can be used in a recipe <coughs> for. ACF based alignment method. Uh, so you, you, you simply follow the computation of ACF with the determination of the rotation. And then when you rotate, after you rotate the image, uh, you can then apply translational uh, <coughs> cross correlation to the rotated versions and wind up with the, with the final. <coughs> okay. So, all right. So, um, in in good tradition, I have uh, <laughs> a number of leftover slides. Yes. Uh, so they will become available, and uh, you. Uh, uh, <coughs> I hope you find uh, useful information in these as well. We do have time for a couple of questions, sure, yeah. uh, but I'll lead off. So, in the beginning, you, you used a foundational program known as Spider for a lot of these cross correlation, a lot of these uh, simple commands. Now, what is your viewpoint now with the greater move to GPUs? How has that opened up 
more use of algorithms in this space? Um, well, uh, a GPU, use of GPUs really implies that you have Kent programs, okay. uh, and uh, which is a sharp distinction from the whole idea of Spider. Spider uh, was, a, uh, was a, a modular program which allowed to you to put a workbench together. You get uh, <coughs> any any ideas uh, of image processing. You can translate into a sequence of. Uh, of commands and can try out uh, what comes out. And, it, and now, nowadays we have uh, highly canned uh, black box uh, programs uh, which, uh, which is uh, highly efficient, but they, they don't provide you the insight, uh, the conceptual insights into what, what is going on. And, and I sort of deplore the demise of the of the uh, modular programs, right. and I like to keep them alive. Uh, now the uh, spider is still uh, alive on on the platform of uh, what's it called? Uh, the Spanish. Uh, Was it Marie Curie? Uh, Scipion. On Scipion, uh, we have a, a version of Spider, and it's invaluable uh, to use these kinds of programs in order to get uh, actually insights. Uh, otherwise, you just rely on on a bunch of people uh, sitting somewhere and uh, <laughs> apply for patents. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a question from the audience. Uh, I can ask yep. one more question. So, so in terms of uh, Richard Henderson, he's been really trying to bring the price point of <coughs> with going after 100 kb fed. Yeah. Uh, in your mind, what do you think will, is that the way to go? Or is there another ways to bring Crowley and more to the masses and make it more accessible? No, I think that's the right way to do, to do it. Uh, 100 kb should, should make instruments more affordable. Uh, I, I don't know how much more affordable, uh, but uh, they, they even, uh, Talk about dem democratization of, of instruments, right? Um, but um, but I think uh, I, even even though the imaging conditions might not might not be ideal uh, nowadays uh, with the power of cameras, uh, we, we we still have leeway mm -hmm. to to get to uh, you know virtually the same kind of performance. So I think it's a good way to go. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that the particles have different zip height. Do you mean the same height? Yeah. So in the end, are they treating all the samples from one image at the, as the same view for the same view? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because uh, there, there are, the particular software has been developed uh, in which you can treat the particles individually. Uh, but, uh, but you have to. Uh, Essentially, be careful because the signal that that comes from one single particle can be very weak. So, so there's uncertainty in the uh, determination of the contrast transfer, uh, transfer function. <coughs> Whether or not it works is highly dependent on the diameter of of the particle. You know, for for large particles such as the ribosome and even larger particles such as the ribosome. Uh, you can afford to do that, but uh, I, d I don't. I don't know exactly where where the limit is uh, when you go toward uh, smaller sizes. Yeah. So the particles which are at the bottom of the ice layer, right? So when the beam hits them, it has already gone through the entire. Is that hundred angstrom? Over a thousand angstrom? Yeah. The ideal length of the, the ice, right? Right. So Well, you know, elastic <coughs> you still have elastically scattered electrons that, that simply go, go through the ice, and, and so they have not lost energy. But you bring it uh, up an interesting point, because you, you might have inelastically scattered electrons 
that then make elastic uh, interaction uh, with the uh, with the molecule, and and so so they produce uh, images that are uh, sort of dislocated, and and they uh, it is as if as if you had an another source of illumination, and uh, it is as if you had uh, sort of partial coherence uh, going on in the specimen. Okay. Let's thank you for coming.